Do all functions have inverses? Consider the function from a set A, which is the numbers 1, 2, 3, and 4, to a set B, which is the letters A, B, and C. And I'll call this function f, and f is going to map 1 to A, 2 to B, 3 to B, and 4 to C. So this function f is surjective, but not injective. It's surjective because every element in the set B has something mapped to it. But it's not injective because the element B has two different things mapped to it. So let's try and create an inverse function for this. In other words, let's find a function that goes from the set B to the set A. Well, in this case, I see that 1 is mapped to A, so I would want to have A mapped back to 1. 2 is mapped to B, so I would want to have B mapped back to 2. 3 is mapped to B, so I would want to have B mapped to 3. But this is a problem, because a function can't map one element to two different things. So this doesn't work. So in this case, we can see that in order for a function to have an inverse, the function has to be injective. Okay, let's look at another example. Suppose I have the set A, which is the numbers 1, 2, and 3, and the set B, which is the letters A, B, C, and D. And this time, I'm going to define a function G, which maps 1 to A, 2 to B, and 3 to D. And in this case, we see that G is injective, but not surjective. It's injective because I see that uh, we have nothing uh, in the set B that has more than one thing mapped to it. But it's not surjective because the element C doesn't have anything mapped to it. Let's try and create an inverse function for this. So we have something going from a set B to a set A. I see that 1 is mapped to A, so I want to have A mapped back to 1. I see that 2 is mapped to B, so I want to have B mapped back to 2. And I see that 3 is mapped to D, so I want to have D mapped back to 3. But here's the problem. Where does C go? So in this case, I see that again, I cannot create an inverse function. In order for a function to have an inverse, the function also must be surjective. So we just saw that in order for a function to have an inverse, it has to be both injective and surjective. And a function that is both injective and surjective is said to be bijective. And remember, we also have uh, other uh, terminology for this. We could also say that something that is injective is one-to-one -one and something that is surjective is onto. So bijective would mean it's both one-to-one -one and onto. And the claim that we have here is that if a function which goes from a set A to a set B uh, exists, then F is invertible, means it has an inverse, if and only if F is bijective. So this is an if and only if statement. We see if and only if. That means it works in both directions. If it's invertible, then it's bijective. If it's bijective, then it's invertible. Let's try and prove this statement. So before we actually go ahead and do a proof, let's try and do a sketch of a proof. So to help us in our sketch of the proof here, I'm going to uh, display a few different things here. First, we have what it means for a function to have an inverse. Remember that if we have a function from a set A to a set B, then F inverse will go from B to A. And that's an inverse if for any element Y in the set B, then f inverse of y equals x if and only if f of x equals y. And then we also have this uh, condition for a function to be invertible in terms of the identity map here. A function f from a set a to a set b is said to be invertible if there exists a function f inverse from b to a such that f inverse composed with f is the identity map on a and f composed with f inverse is the identity map on b. And the thing we're trying to prove is if we have a function from a set A to a set B, then F is invertible if and only if F is bijective. So since we have the if and only if, we have to go in both directions. So first, let's look at the forward direction. This is the direction saying that if F is invertible, then F is bijective. Okay, so we have to prove that F is bijective. That means that we have to show that it's both injective and surjective. So let's look at each of these things. So first, injective. Okay, well, if it's injective, then that means that f of x equals f of y 
implies that x equals y. So I have to show that x equals y. Well, how can I do that? I have to somehow show that this element x equals this element y. And the only way using these definitions up here that I can do that is using the identity map. Remember, the identity map says that f inverse composed with f on some element x is x. But what is this f inverse composed with f? That's just f inverse of f of x. So that's the same thing as saying that equals x. But hey, wait a second, f of x equals f of y. So I think I see a way to connect these two things. So I could say something like x, which is f inverse of f of x. That's the same thing as f inverse of f of y, because f of x equals f of y, just replacing this thing in here with f of y. That's because of this, uh, this condition up here, which I'm allowed to do if I'm uh, showing its injective. And then that is just y. So that works. That shows that it's injective. What about surjective? Usually uh, surjective is the trickier part. So if it's surjective, I need to pick some element that's in the set B, because remember f goes from A to B. So I have to pick something in B. Well, let's let element B be in B. And I have to find something that's mapped to B. Hmm. Well, again, I have function composition to work with here. So let's just write out that condition and see what that looks like. And maybe something will jump out here. So we have f composed with f inverse of the element b. Notice I have to do it in this order because b, the element little b, is from the element or from the set big B. So the inverse, which is going to act first, has to act on something in the set b. And I know that this is going to give us back b because that works like the identity map here. Well, let's write it out again. So that's the same thing as f of f inverse of b equaling b. And I think I found something that maps to b. I can just say that this thing right here, f inverse of b, so I can call it a, so that f of a equals b. So I found something that gets mapped to b, namely f inverse of b. Okay, so that takes care of that direction. What about the other direction? So now I'm assuming that it's bijective and I need to show that it's invertible. Well, in order to do this, let's create a function that looks like an inverse function and show that it is well defined. Suppose we have some function g which goes from b back to a and which behaves like an inverse function. So if it's an inverse function, then I know that g of some element y equals x is true if and only if f of x equals y. So I somehow need to show this, show that this function exists. Well, let's think about it. I know that f is bijective. So if I have some kind of a set A and I have another set B and I have my function f and it maps say some element x right here to some element y right here. Well, I know that f is going to map x to y. And I also know that since that the uh, function is bijective, it's both injective and surjective. So that means that it's the only thing that's mapped to y. Nothing else must be mapped to y. And I also know that everything in here has something mapped to it because f is surjective. That means that there's something that must go backwards. That's the g that I'm trying to look for here. So I think that that shows it. If uh, I just say this in words here, just to go through it again, we know that f is injective. So that means that every element that's in the set b has no more than uh, one thing mapped to it. And it's surjective, meaning that everything has at least one thing mapped to it. So I think that means that everything has one, everything in the set B, every element here, has one and only one thing mapped to it from the set A. And that's, that works for this condition right here. The only other thing I should probably check is this uh, function composition condition, but that's pretty easy. I can say that f of g of y equals, well, g of y is x, so that's f of x, but f of x 
is y. So that works like the identity map. And if I go the other way around, g of f of, and now I have to put x in here, equals g of, what's f of x? That's y. And what's g of y? That's x. So this seems to work. I think we're ready to actually do a formal proof. Okay, so we're trying to prove that if f is a function from a to b, then f is invertible if and only if f is bijective. Here's the proof. So first we're going to do the forward direction. Suppose f is invertible. So I'm trying to show then that f is bijective. So if f is invertible, then I know that f inverse exists. That's what it means to be invertible. So first, let's show that it's injective. So to show that f is injective, I'm going to start by supposing that I have two elements, x and y, that are in the set A, and that f of x equals f of y. And my goal is to show that x equals y. Well, remember how we did this. X is just f inverse of f of x, but since f of x equals f of y, that equals f inverse of f of y, which is just y. So f is injective. Great. Now let's show that it's surjective. So I'm going to let little b be some element in the set big B. Then f of f inverse of little b is just b. That's the uh, identity map. And so if we let the uh, element a equal f inverse of b, then we found something in the set a such that f of a equals b. So f is surjective. And if f is injective, and if f is surjective, then f is bijective. Okay, now let's try the other direction. Suppose f is bijective. Now I have to show that f is invertible. So let's define a function g which goes from b to a, such that for any element y that's in the set b, g of y will be the element x in the set a, such that g of y equals x. And I need to show that g acts as the inverse function. Since f is surjective, we know that such an x exists. And since f is injective, we know that such an x has to be unique. So g is a well-defined function. But does it satisfy the function composition property that gives us the identity function? Well, for any element y in the set b, we know that f composed with g acting on the element y is f of g of y, which is just f of x, which is y. So that works. How about the other way around? g composed with f of x is g of f of x, which is g of y, which is just x. So g is f inverse, and f is invertible. So notice that this theorem here, if f is invertible, then f is bijective, or the other way around, this allows us to tell if a function has an inverse without actually explicitly finding the inverse. All we need to do is show that the function is bijective.